I've been sand casting in my garage for almost a decade. I've tried all kinds of equipment. I've built some, I bought some, I loved some, I lost money on some, but at least now I know what actually works. So today I'm gonna walk you through a beginner setup that can get you started without wasting time and money. And uh, I really wish it was around when I got started. If it had been, I would have saved hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars and years of frustration. And if you want like the links of where to go to actually get this stuff, I'll put that all in a guide, free guide down below. Some of you might remember I made a video like this last year and the year before some new stuff has come out and I've also cut a bunch of stuff from the list and then I've added in a bunch of tips and tricks you know things to think about things to avoid I'm gonna splice in a bunch of clips of the last version of me wearing this same shirt which I'm sure will be completely indistinguishable so how do we get started there are multiple ways to cast metal and they're all awesome in my opinion if you don't have a dire need to do something else like investment casting for jewelry or whatever I'm gonna suggest you start with sand casting first you need something to cast uh, this comes in the form of a pattern. Pattern is the thing that you make that isn't metal that you use to make the hole in the sand mold into which you pour the metal. Do you follow that? I have used wooden patterns in the past. Here's one. It worked out great, but I don't want to tell you to start sand casting by learning woodworking first. Unless you already do woodworking, then go nuts. It might be easier for you to start with a 3D printer, resin or FDM, they both work. 3D model or download a file and then print that. That aluminum bronze forging hammer that I made years ago, sand cast from a 3D print. My little shop sign here in bronze, sand cast from a 3D print. I don't have time to like carve all the little details in this sign, but I can 3D model it very quickly and then print the thing out of my sleep. If you don't have a 3D printer and you wanna get started, um, a simple cheap one that works really well is the Elegoo Centauri Carbon. Go check that one out. It's tough to beat for the price. One tip I'll give you for making patterns in wood or plastic, they need draft. It's a design feature. Here's a shot I use to demonstrate that. Once you understand what draft is, you're gonna see it everywhere. The pattern needs to come out of the sand without disrupting the sand mold. That includes every single letter on this pattern here that I use to make this. If you were a kid and you made sand castles like those plastic castle molds, you put the sand in and pack it in and you remove it, you have seen draft in action. Okay, draft's not really a piece of equipment, but now onto the equipment. You can't sand cast without sand and something to put the sand in. This is a very simple way to start. You can buy this, this is called a flask. It has two pieces. This you can use vertically. You don't have to build it from wood. It has little locating pins and you can buy it with a kit that comes with 10 pounds of Petrobon sand. Petrobon, the red sand. If you watch videos and see they're using like a red looking sand, that's Petrobon. Petrobon is an oil bonded sand. I personally like it because it's really sticky, which you want in a casting sand. And unlike green sand, which is the main alternative, green sand is a water bonded sand. Uh, you don't have to worry about moisture. And Petrobon gives you really nice detail. If you're just gonna get started, just buy a bag of Petrobon. A tip for handling Petrobon, I wear nitrile gloves now. That stuff will stick to your skin like crazy and it's just hard to get off. It'll also stick to itself, which means you can't like lay it down evenly. You'll pick up a big block. Uh, so you need something called a riddle. A riddle is a, a tool that you pass the sand through to just break up the clumps, especially when you're first like putting the first layer of sand down. A riddle is not a special <laughs> fancy tool that you have to pay a million dollars for. Here's mine. Uh, it's, it looks like it's maybe a uh, 16 mesh. So if you ever see people taking the sand in the videos, putting it through and either shaking, you can't really shake Petrobon through, you have to push it through. That's why we call it a riddle. You probably have one that you can just swipe out of the kitchen. A tip with the metal sieves, the wire mesh is crimped into this rim. If you push too hard, you can pull that mesh out of that crimped rim. It will not go back in. So be careful about that. Next, you need parting powder. All of the stuff I have at reach. I've been using this. Now this is Johnson's baby powder and it's a very old bottle of Johnson's baby powder which means this is talc. Modern baby powder is not talc. It's generally cornstarch. Cornstarch does not work. So instead you go on Amazon and you look up parting powder. You can get a couple pounds of it. It's gonna say uh, non-silica par parting powder. That's important because traditionally foundry workers used silica powder which is glass finely powderized glass. You don't want to breathe any parting powder, obviously. You can get parting powder now, foundry parting powder, designed to work with Petrobond on Amazon now. If for whatever reason, you still want talc specifically, I would look at a pottery supply place. Potters use talc, they mix it in when they make uh, clays and glazes. A lot of times they use talc in their real talc as a, as a flux, then you can get 325 mesh, 10 pound bag for not very much, and that'll last you an eternity. Next up, a dross scooper. When you watch metal casting, you might see the crucible with the molten metal in there and there'll be like a skin or there'll be a bunch of grime on the surface of the liquid metal, right? And they usually take some kind of scooper and they scoop it off. Uh, I've been using this. 
A scavenged stainless kitchen spoon. I clamp it on the end of some vice grips, wear a big leather glove, and just scoop the crud off the top. Now, I'm gonna show a picture of one that's a stainless steel spoon. It's a very small end and a very long handle. And the reason for that's gonna be obvious in a little bit when we get to the melting furnace. It's a good idea to have a longer handle than a shorter one. Your hand will get very hot when it's really close to the molten metal, especially high temperature metals like, like copper. So just a little longer is better. Next up is an ingot mold. I have a couple here, they're different sizes. These are graphite. When you melt metal, you often melt more than you need. You definitely don't wanna melt less than you need, right? And you need some place to pour that because you can't leave it in the crucible. I usually pour them into ingot molds like this. I like the graphite ones because when the metal cools, when it's cold, you just pick it up, tip it over, ingot falls out. If you try to use like the uh, muffin tin ingot trays and you pour bronze in there, the bronze will braze itself to the muffin tin. That's not good. It will not braze itself to this. Also, these ingots are very small and that's important. You will see soon when we get to the uh, furnace. Really a tip, smaller is better. You want a lot of these or maybe these instead of like one or two of these. These are kind of difficult to manage. Okay, so how are we gonna melt the metal? If you're new to this, I'm gonna suggest you use one of these. It's an electric furnace and it's kind of difficult to get in shot. It just plugs into a wall, a normal wall outlet. It heats up to the temperature you set it on here and that's it. It comes with crucibles, it comes with tongs, it comes with gloves, a bunch of stuff you need all in one kit. And most importantly, this furnace gives you temperature control. A lot of new metal casters will overheat or underheat the metal and this at least gives you repeatable temperature that you can then dial in and use it over and over. Eliminating variables like that, especially early on, will make it easier for you. I'm not gonna go over pros and cons of these things in this video because I just made a long, full long video about electric furnaces. I'll put a link to that at the end. The only issue here is the size. These came with a one kilogram crucible, which is this big, not very big, and a three, triple this size, um, which is actually not that small. You can fit these, these one pound ZA12 ingots in there that we'll talk about in a minute, but only about two and a half of them. That's a lot more than you think, but now they have one like this. They have a five kilogram version. It's significantly larger. It's a different furnace. This one's painted orange. Very cool. And that opens up possibilities a lot more than you think. Don't get hung up on the, the one, three or five kilogram number. The three kilogram will hold about two and a half of these, two and a half pounds of ZA12. This will hold almost four pounds of ZA12. If you do the math, that's about five pounds of a copper or bronze alloy, about a pound and a half of aluminum. Just don't fill them up to the brim, you know, for safety. If you're new, you really don't want to cast stuff that's bigger than that anyway. Start small, get comfortable, then upsize. This electric furnace is probably the easiest way to get started, and I recommend that entirely for beginners. But I know some of you will still want propane gas because fire is cool. There are some gas furnace kits that seem pretty good. They're made by a company called Devil Forge. Now, disclaimer, I have never personally used a Devil Forge product, but I've heard good things from people I trust. My gas furnace was built by me from scratch. That includes the burner and my crucible tongs. I learned a lot of things about a lot of things building that, uh, chiefly among them how bad of an idea it is to build your own thing from scratch when you can buy one for cheaper. I probably spent triple the amount of money it would cost to just buy one. And my setup, especially the burner, is a little like, eh. I did not, however, make my own crucibles. The crucible is the thing that holds the metal. That also means if these break, this is the thing that the molten metal will pour out of. That's not good. Most of the discount gas furnaces come with crucibles that scare me, just from the pictures. And those like, those like vice grip tongs they tell you to pick it up, that is a fantastic way to ruin a crucible. The Devil Forge kit, the reason I like it and the reason I'm mentioning it at all is because the crucible looks a little better and it has tongs that actually like grab it from, from like around. I get my crucibles from a company called PMC Supplies. They do have an Amazon store and their own website. And the tongs I use wrap around. Just keep in mind, none of them last forever. Crucibles are kind of wear and tear items. Don't overuse them, don't overfill them, especially the ones for the electric furnaces. Learn that one the hard way. Another crucible tip, I know it's expensive, but use a different crucible for each type of metal. You'll prevent problems like contamination that way. Now the metal, where do you get the metal? Well, there's a bunch of places you can buy it. Uh, I'm gonna link a few down below. Uh, Rio Grande is one, here's some from Rio Grande. I've also purchased metal from a company called Roto Metals, rotometals.com and belmontmetals.com. They all seem like good places. This right here from Rio Grande. Rio Grande is a, a jewelry supplier and you can get five pounds of ancient bronze, which is copper and tin, for less than 20 bucks a pound, which is cheaper than the cost of just like nice copper ingots, right? And it comes in this very clean grain. Ooh, shiny, shiny, shiny. I don't know, I dropped one. 
These days you can get a zinc alloy in small chunks that fit in the electric crucibles. You can get those from Roto Metals. This is the way I used to buy ZA12. It's giant. This barely fits in even the larger gas ones. It's too big. But now Roto Metals sells them in this size. See, considerably smaller. This will fit in an electric crucible. Bronze is a little cooler looking in general and it's a bit more hardcore, but it takes an extra thousand degrees, which is more energy, more wear and tear on things. If you want my opinion, ZA12 for beginners is the metal to go with. It's low temperature, but it's not soft like pewter. In fact, it's tougher than aluminum. The former archeologist in me loves ancient bronze, but ZA12 is awesome. And it's cheaper by a lot. Buy ingots of this stuff. Don't use scrap metal if you're new to this. I'm like a broken record here. Seriously, you will eliminate like 50% of your casting problems right off the bat using clean metal to begin with. Learn how to use scrap later. Now, printable parts. There are some tools that you can't just go and buy. They don't have them in a hardware store, they don't have them on Amazon, but you have a 3D printer, so you can just make them if you get the right files. I will give you the files. This sand rammer that you've seen me use in many videos for many years was cast from a 3D print. That's basically how I do metal casting. Here is a printed version of it. I have used the printed version also as a sand rammer and it works. You don't need to go all the way to making in metal, but what, am I not gonna make one in metal? Of course I'm gonna make one in metal. Here's how they print. You can print them flat without support material on an FDM printer. And I've been told it fits on a Mars 3, possibly. It definitely fits on like a Saturn, Elegoo Saturn resin printer. You print two, get some locating dowels in there, stick them together, you can use it like this. I have the STL for this on my mini factory. Go nuts. Next, I have some uh, gating tools. I use this to form something called a pouring basin. This is a tapered sprue former. I have runner formers. These can, these can help you design the ways that the metal go through the mold. All of my gating tools that I use are 3D printed. They're easy enough to 3D print. I don't have the files for all these available because uh, the design of them really depends on the uh, flask size and design. If you're using this small cast iron one, you really don't like, do you really need a sprue former this big? It doesn't fit, that's what I'm saying. Now, there are also a couple of things that you can just find probably around your house. First one, two socks. Get a pair of socks, no holes. Take one sock, stick it inside the other sock. Then in the inside sock, the inner sock, fill that with your parting powder. The way you use that, you take the sock and you shake it over the pattern or whatever you need the parting powder on. It will come through the socks and distribute nice and evenly around the pattern. Now to go with that, I would suggest swipe a makeup brush from your bathroom. I don't know how long my wife has been missing this, but uh, here it is. Now this might be more important because I just spray the powder out of the bottle. But what I use this for is I move the piles of parting powder like into nooks and crannies that I didn't get because this doesn't squirt out as easily as the sock shaking thing. Might also be useful for brushing loose sand away. Next up, a striking tool. Now that's when you're, when you're ramming up the sand, you get to the top and it's kind of lumpy. You need to shave it smooth. I use this, it's just a piece of angle iron. Probably use a ruler, metal ruler. As long as the tool is longer, then your flask is wide, you can scrape the extra sand off the top. Then, lastly, you need a vent wire. Here's mine. It's basically just a TIG filler rod. I use this to poke holes through the sand, which allows air to get out more easily. If you're not into welding, you don't have a TIG welder with the filler rod you can swipe, go in your bedroom closet, find a wire hanger, straighten that out. You now have a vent wire. Using all of that stuff that I just said, you can start sand casting. Once you get going, then you can scale up. Bigger flasks, more sand, uh, that's about all you need. Bigger flask and more sand to scale up. Everything else is the same. So if you want anything I showed you today for the free SDLs for stuff, links to where to buy the equipment, uh, some tips and tricks that I didn't have time to include in this video, uh, there's a free guide down below in the pinned comment. Sign up for that, it'll show up in your inbox. Now go get making stuff. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and click on the video to see uh, a little more in-depth explanation of these electric furnaces. See you next time. <laughs>